بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا ومنحنا يا ربنا علما وعملا وقربا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أكرمنا ولا تهنا وأعطنا ولا تحرمنا وآثرنا ولا تؤثر علينا وأرضنا وارض عنا يا كريم سو الحمد لله الحمد لله وهي to look at this concept of oh Allah take away my pain and um, it may not be as simple as uh, as we once thought so pain is a necessary part of life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it and he said وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ fitna. We try you with evil or with harm and with good. Both of these are what? Are a fitna. What does fitna mean? In order to move forward, let's look at fitna. Fitna, the root word means for something to be shaken. But not necessarily just being shaken physically, but um, for, it, for something to be affected in a way that that's better. For, for something to be affected in a way that it causes uh, an upheaval, a change of states. So the word is usually used, like Imam Rafi Bala Swahani says, that it's used for uh, gold, testing gold. So in the past, <coughs> they would mint coins with gold and silver. But pure gold is really malleable. You can bend it quite easily, so you can break the coins. So they would add other other materials to it. And sometimes they could add other metals and the the metal that that's the alloy that's not, to make an alloy and the metal that's been added will still won't take over the colour of gold. So it'll look look like gold but it's not gold. So they would it's called fitna, they would melt it down. So the physical body of the gold now changes into liquid. And then once it's separated, the, the, the metals separate themselves. Once it's melted, they all separate. You can see what's gold, what's zinc, what's copper. And that's a fitna. So a fitna is any situation that can push a person to their limits, that can knock a person sideways. And وَفَتَنَّاكَ فُتُونَ Really powerful, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet uh, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, when revelation came to him, he was roughly 40 years old, and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam at that time, when Allah was speaking to him through the burning tree, <coughs> or the burning bush, Allah recounted, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, وَفَتَنَّا كَفُتُونَ And we tried you with many, many crushing blows, many crushing tries, these things, that knock a person off. So this is the nature of uh, existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us to try us. Why? Because the end goal is the pleasure of Allah. And Allah wants to, is created us to reward us because of his generosity. Someone who's generous can't help but giving. So Allah has created us because he wants to give to us and reward us in a way that's equivalent and that's commensurate with his generosity. And that's, that's only possible in a manner that's infinite. In a manner that's infinite and vast. So that can only happen in paradise. We can get some taste and some idea of Allah's generosity, but Allah has created us for paradise. So if you're all going to paradise, who deserves the best seat in the house? And who deserves something less, right? If Allah is capable of doing anything, the rewards are all uh, ascending in nature. What the person with the least reward in paradise gets <coughs> is far, far inferior to what you know the people on the higher levels will get. And yet, what the beautiful thing about this in paradise is, we could all be together. And we could all be sat with prophets and you know the awliya, and no one would feel I've got you know I've got the worst seat in the house. Everyone would feel like you know I've been truly blessed and honoured. So the reward and the the greatness of that reward is all inward. 
So, because of that, we tested who deserves what. So pain here is a necessary part of it, just as ease and good is, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us for what is called an ibtila. And ibtila, uh, the root word in Arabic comes from bila, which is where a cloth, when a cloth gets worn away, you know sometimes the cloth get, clothes get worn away at the, at the elbows or at the knees, points of contact. So it's like that. So an ibtila is a long-term test. And sometimes it can be a long-term intense test. And it can wear a person down. Wear a person down. You, know, you, you speak to a person and they say, oh, I'm only 20 years old, but I feel like I'm 50. Right? Why? They've been worn down by the tribe. So <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for this the, the ibtila. And the ibtila... It can be with ease as well as with difficulty, right? But let's just focus on this concept of pain. So, can pain be removed? Yes, of course. So, we have to look at matters in, from two perspectives. Pain, that's there <coughs> when we can do something about it. And which is when there are practical steps to be taken. The Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam both indicate this. If there's a practical step you can take, go do it. Tadawu ya ibad Allah. Seek treatment, O servants of Allah, the Prophet told yeah, the Sahaba, right? Seek medical treatment for illnesses. And because Allah has made it a means to an end. You take, a, uh, you take some medicine and it will aid in the recovery. And then... So that's one situation where you can do something about it. And then there are other situations when you can't do something about it. So the first situation, <coughs> you take the means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you. And you look for those means. So if it's from a person, you go ask that person. You ask Allah first. And then uh, you go ask that person for help. If it's through a process, a procedure, you do this. And that's what will happen. And don't worry about the time frame. I'll come to this shortly. But remember, everything happens according to the will of Allah. And there's wisdom behind this, which we'll talk about. Okay, so that's something you can practically do. One thing you can practically do is dua. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, call on me. I will certainly respond. So people must misunderstand this because they say, oh, my dua wasn't answered or it was answered, it will be answered, right? And the term here, answered, is actually quite apt, quite accurate. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers duas, but the answer isn't always what you demand. I've been praying for so long, I've been asking this for so long, why hasn't I become a billionaire yet? Right? It's been six weeks, right? So it doesn't always work like that, right? Uh, part of the adab of dua is that you keep asking, you, you, and you ask with your entire heart, your being, oh Allah, please. That's, Allah loves to see that in his slaves. So <coughs> you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these things, and you get one of the three things. Either what you've asked for is given, as the Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or an equivalent amount of harm is deflected from you. <coughs> yeah? So you ask for a job and you might not get that job, but you know the manager changes his mind about sacking you. Right? So you get to keep your own job. Or it's saved for the akhirah. And by the very nature of human beings, we think, forget the akhirah, I want it now. Right? And in reality, What's saved for the Akhirah is far, far better for us than what we get here, right? People in the Akhirah will look at the rewards that they get and they'll, wish, I wish, they'll think, I wish none of my prayers were ever answered. So bearing in mind these three things, you also have to understand that the response to your prayers, it happens, A, on Allah's terms, what you ask, you may not get, He gives what He wants. And B, 
It happens on Allah's schedule. When He wants it to happen, it will come about. You can't force Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is a very important lesson. Because sometimes, um, you know, religious people fall into it. Oh, if, you, if you've got a problem, send a thousand salawat on the Prophet or ten thousand and watch what will happen. Right? And uh, there's a, a friend of mine once, he mentioned uh, um, a famous wording of the Prophet, of the salah on the Prophet. Allahumma salli salaman, uh, Allahumma salli wa sallam, salaman taman, uh, what is it? Salatun kamilatun, I forgot the wording now. Allah Sayyidina Muhammadin Alabi Tan Hallu bihi al Uqadu Tan Faraju bihi al Qurub. Anyway, this long one takes <coughs> takes about 30, 30 seconds to say. And he once said to me, if you ever have a problem, just do this 44,444 uh, times. Right? You'll get what you want. And I don't think I want it after that. <laughs> it takes so long. Um, so this is this is not a magic wand. At best, something like this can be a means, a means of asking. And a means can be successful, and a means can be unsuccessful. Some are stronger, like getting up and praying in the last third of the night, that dua, is more likely for you to get a response. But the response is not necessarily what you ask for, right? So this is one way. <coughs> when you have pain, you ask Allah, you turn to Allah. But also remember, there are two things in life in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generally tests us. You can, you can look at them in two broad ways. What they say, mani'. What does mana mean? What do you say? Mana, I prevented you, I stopped you, I forbade you. In Arabic, the root is similar. Mani' means that you're prevented from something. Right? You're prevented from getting something. A one-way road, coming the other way in Arabic, they'll say, Mamnu' You can't go in this way. You're prevented. And its opposite is Ata. Two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Mu'ati, the one who gives. Al-Mani' The one who withholds or prevents you from getting something. Both are blessings. Both are blessings. So you may really desperately want something in life. And it just doesn't come. You can be praying and you can be trying all the tricks in the book. And I've, I've got some of the books full of tricks, right? And uh, trust me, it's not a guarantee. At best, it's a way of asking. So you can try all of these things and nothing works. So Sidi Ahmad ibn Atai, la secondary one of the greatest of the awliya, in his amazing work, he said, Whenever Allah opens a door of understanding for something you've been prevented, for something you've been withheld from, it's been withheld from you, whenever He opens that door of understanding as to why that prevention, that, that thing He didn't give you, becomes a gift in and of itself. Right? You want something in life, you've been chasing this, and I really want this, and oh Allah, please, and I'm even fasting, and I'm even doing this, please. And you're doing all of this, the, everything you can, but you don't get. And you have to remember this. Who are you dealing with? Right? A tight person, if you go up to him, can you make a, a donation to you? Or, you know, or something. This person feels awkward. Like, no, I don't. Can you, you know, can you lend me some money? They feel awkward. But a generous person, you go ask them, and they are happily give. Right? They feel awkward not giving. They feel constricted by not showing generosity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely generous. Right? So generous that <coughs> you can have a person that swears at him, so rejects him, rejects his messengers, and this person can live a thousand years and he'll find food on his table every day, he'll find clothes on his body. He'll find blessings all throughout his life. Allah gives and gives and gives. Saha is flooding with gifts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how Allah is. So that's the same Lord you're dealing with when you're dealing with your pain. Right? So if you hold something back, it's not because he's unwilling to give out of, you know, because he has a desire to keep it, but it's because it, there's no good in it for you. Right? 
So that's one means of looking at pain. The other way of uh, looking and understanding this is understanding the framework of our existence. What does the Quran say? Inna Allah hashtara min al-mu'minina amwalahum wa anfusahum bi anna lahum al-jannah. Indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers. When you make that transaction, when you say, I affirm, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. You're just, you're just saying that you affirm this, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah. But in it, there's a contract, there's an agreement. You, I'll fast, I'll pray, I'll avoid these things, I'll try and do my best to do these things. There's a contract. So from in that statement, that contract, he says, Allah has purchased from the believers you, their properties, their wealth, and everything else they have, and their own lives. Just look at the... Allah honors us by, even with this address. You don't, you don't own your own existence. You didn't choose to come into existence. He created you. So he owns all of us. And yet he's still saying, I've purchased this from you. Because when you, when you sell something to someone, you always get something in return. <coughs> so what's the price? What price has he paid us? What do we get out of the deal? بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ In exchange that we get paradise. We get the garden. Anyone who's a believer, whether they, they do good or bad in their lives, <coughs> at some point in their existence, whether there's a punishment before or not, at some point in, existence, in their existence, they will enter paradise. Never to leave it. The last person to leave hell, his own personal space in paradise, he'll get whatever he wishes for, and his own personal space will be ten times the size of earth. We're talking the worst person, worst believer ever. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him this much and more. <coughs> so, this is, the, this is the reality. Allah is the master, we are the slaves. So as I said, there's pain you can take care of practically or by through <laughs> dua. Great. <coughs> and then there's other type of pain which you can't take care of. What do they call it? Palliative care? Where you do what you can to minimize the suffering and the difficulty. Because if Allah has decided that He's going to test you with something, no one is going to turn it away. Everything is dependent on the will of Allah. Everything is dependent on the will of Allah. And, it's, and it, the divine will, is not dependent on anything else. Nothing can force Allah to do anything. No one can force Allah. Oh Allah, think how these people say, Oh Allah, uh, if you let me pass my exam, uh, I'll, I'll go on an umrah, or I'll fast this many fasts. No, it, don't, it won't change it. Your deal that you've struck there won't change anything. Right? <coughs> Rather... <coughs> So what do you do in this situation? This, not everyone is tried with. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man ashaddu nasi bala'an? Who has the most difficult tests? And he said, Al-Anbiya, the Prophets. Why do they have the most difficult tests? Because in reality, they've got the greatest blessing. Sirat al an'amta alayhim. You ask to be guided on the way who Allah has blessed. Who has He blessed them with? Are we talking about long life? Disbelievers have long lives. Are we talking about you know, money? Disbelievers have, have money. Right? Are we talking about friends, family, support? Are we talking about uh, <coughs> influence, status? Disbelievers have all those things. No. An'amta alayhim in Surah Al-Fatiha refers to the blessing of deen. The blessing of having a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the real blessing. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a famous hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad, he said, Inna Allah qasama baynakum akhlaqakum kama qasama baynakum arzaqakum. Allah has apportioned the distribution that Allah gives 
your your kismah. You've heard the word kismat, yeah? Yeah? What does kismat mean? People think destiny. What it actually means, kismah is the apportioning. Like if I have a, a cake, I cut it into slices, you get one slice, you can have two, uh, you don't get anything, you know. What, that, what I give out, that's the kismah. So what your share, what you've got, your share is actually what you call your nasib, which is also another word to use for destiny. But it's actually your share that you've got. So the kisma that Allah has given in wealth, physical uh, wealth and spiritual growth, that is all divided by Allah with the wisdom. And uh, just as he's distributed that, he's distributed your character, your traits, how you are. Meaning your natural disposition. Some people are naturally aggressive. Some people are naturally generous. These qualities Allah gives, but we also have a means of adapting and changing them, growing beyond them, right? So then he says, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ And here's the point of the hadith. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَنْ Allah mighty and majestic. يُعْطِي الدُّنْيَا مَنْ يُحِبْ وَمَنْ لَا يُحِبْ Allah gives the dunya. The dunya here... It's anything that's not connected to Allah. But generally, it's used here in the terms of material wealth. Allah gives the dunya to those who he loves and those who he doesn't love. Right? <coughs> and what distinguishes a person from being someone who Allah loves and who Allah doesn't love? Allah loves all of his creation. But it's those actions and choices people make that turn people in, you know, down one road or the other. Inna, ha, inna, what is it? Inna hadayna hus sabila. We made the, we guided him to the way. Imma shakiran wa imma kafura. So we, Allah should, said, we showed the human being the way. Either he's grateful, the highest of that is iman, or he's an ingrate, ungrateful. So he said, Allah gives the dunya to those who he loves and those he doesn't love. وَلَا يُعْطِي الدِّينَ إِلَّا مَنْ يُحِبْ And he doesn't give deen here. Deen, here you translate as a relationship with Allah, a connection to Allah. He doesn't give deen here, he doesn't give to deen only to, uh, he doesn't give deen to those who he does not love. فَمَنْ أَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ الدِّينَ فَقَدْ أَحَبَّهُ If you want proof. Whoever Allah gives the deen to, we are sahih by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever Allah has given the deen to, he really loves. Now it's just, there are ranks, right? Some are less, less lovable than others and some are more, right? So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> distributes this. So the Prophet said, sallallahu uh, alayhi wa sallam, who gets the hardest trials? He said, al-anbiya. The prophets, because they get the greatest relationship with him, the greatest connection of their iman, and the greatest responsibilities. So through that burden, the harder the, uh, the hardest trials come to them. Fal amthalu, fal amthalu, and then those who resemble the prophets in what looks wealth, no, in that relationship with Allah, <coughs> and this. I'm sorry to say there's no barometer, right? There's no way that we can decide any of this, right? There are some indications, and, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has veiled what's in here from everyone, right? And he sees, so you don't look at a person how disgusting, right? This person's, you know, what's the point in him even praying? He does this, he does that, right? Allah can give it over to someone and they can change, and you... Don't judge something until it's ended, right? How many a person there were, there was, right, doing, you know, committing heinous crimes, and then how are they ten years later, twenty years later? How are they at the end of their life, right? So he said, those who resemble the prophets the most, then those who resemble those people the most, they get the hardest trials, the problems pounding down on them, left, right, and center. They're being stretched and they're being squeezed and they're being crushed and they're being pounded from every direction over and over and over. You know, Allah knows your buttons, so to speak. The buttons someone needs to push to get you upset, Allah knows them. 
And, you know, how is it done? It's done through people. And usually, uh, at a time when Allah wants you to develop a stronger relationship with Him, what does He do? He asks, um, He sends the people against you. The way it happens is, is are various. One of the awliya, uh, <coughs> Abu al-Hassan al-Shabili, he, was, he, he, he wanted to study with someone. Uh, and he was a murabit. A murabit is someone who uh, lives at the border of the Muslim lands and he's a lookout. So, you know, he, he'll, raise, he'll sound the alarm if an enemy uh, army comes to attack. And so he lives alone, there's no one there, and it's a solitary job. That's why someone who's a murabit gets the reward of someone who's in warfare constantly, just by that. So anyway, <coughs> he went to see him, and this wali was in a cave, he's in a cave, and he was spending his night there. And so he went and he's, he was just listening at the cave. And what is this man asking for? He's asking for something, don't do this, right? There's one part of his dua you should do. Don't be doing the rest, right? So he's saying, he's saying, oh Allah, I want such closeness to you, such sweetness in my relationship with you that I don't think of anyone else. So what does he do? He asks Allah to make people hate him. Asks Allah to uh, turn everyone against him. So he can't go to any of those people all he has is Allah. And there's, there's other verses, there's other uh, people that have asked this. And this is a particular statement for particular people, don't do this. But anyway, what did he say? One of the most, uh, he said, you know, let's learn this dua together, right? All right, switch your brains on, memorization mode. Allahumma, you should all know that, right? Say it with me. Allahumma, Allahumma. kun, Li. That's it. Allahumma. Kun. Li. O Allah. Be mine. What's that? He's asking for that special closeness. So this is how it is. Allahumma. Kun. Li. Be mine. <coughs> so this is what he was asking for. More and more problems from people. Uh, so he could only turn to Allah. So this type of pain, if Allah tests a person with, but you can't escape, what you can do is you can understand it. You can understand the concept, right? Because what happens? <coughs> a lot of the time, the pain's going to be there because of very, we're human beings, we're built to suffer pain. We're built in this way. We're built with physical weaknesses, frailties, bacteria can knock us out. <coughs> you know, you can fall, you can you know, dislocate your shoulder or something, that's subhanAllah. And so these things, and then you are built to, to feel joy and pain internally, emotionally, right? There was this um, book that I read uh, by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. He was a leading um, trauma therapist. And uh, so he said um, in this book, what they, what they did, they did a test, they got a group of people and they, they hooked them up to, not an MRI machine, but something that can scan their brains. And they put them in, um, they put them in a game. So they're all uh, isolated and they're all playing a computer game, <coughs> volleyball. And they, they split into teams beforehand, right? But what they didn't know is that the, t the, the game is rigged. Everyone in that game, when they were playing, they were playing a separate game where they're left out. So they were thinking, everyone else is playing and having fun, but they, they're not passing the, the ball to me. So what happened, the same parts of the brain that light up when there's physical pain, they lit up when they were feeling emotional pain, right? Another lady, he talked about her, her daughter died. <coughs> they put in a, a machine to scan <coughs> the activity, her neural activity. And they told her, recall, tell us about what happened. And she said, I was parked at some traffic lights and my daughter couldn't get her belt on or whatever. So um, anyway, she started driving and the daughter was saying, I still can't get it. So she kept driving and she turned, she turned back to help the daughter with the belt. And a, a truck came and hit the, she went through a light or something. And a truck came and hit the car and her daughter died. Very sad. But at that same moment, 
she was feeling the same pain that she felt at that incident. The same emotional pain, right? Allah gives pause for thought how you treat people, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built his like this. So if pain is meant to be in the picture, it's going to be in the picture. You can't avoid it. But at the same time, <clears throat> what you can do is you can understand. You can understand uh, the situation. Um, how long are we going on for? That's at 12 past 6. six. Okay. Have you got the VMC phone? The VMC phone? We could do some Q&A. Yeah. All right. What we'll do, we'll, we'll have some Q&A at the end. We've got a question. If you want to just text it to Sidi Hamza. Yeah, yeah on, the, on the WhatsApp. And then uh, he can just forward it to me or something. All right. Okay. So, <coughs> if I built like this, it said, the people with the most difficult trials are the prophets. And those who resemble them the most, and those who re 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 resemble them the most. And he said, Yubtalu rajulu ala hasabi dini. He said, the man, a man is tried in accordance to his deen. Does it only apply to a man? In some situations, some uh, parlance is in Arabic, the word man can refer to a woman. I'm not talking about the aunties with the beards. <laughs> I'm distinguishing between male and female and here a man right? what the awliya say if a person's heart is connected to Allah he's a man right? that someone who just wants more toys and this you know, piece of tech and that piece of tech and then he doesn't care about the akhirah or anything like that you don't class him as a man but someone whose heart is connected to Allah and the akhirah a man and the same for a female, she'd be classed as a man in that regard. You're not looking at the gender aspect here. You're looking at the aspect of determination, strength, resolve, right? So you said a person is tried according to his deen, how strong his relationship with Allah is. For in kind of deen, he sulban ishtadda balauhu. If his relationship with Allah is solid, his trial is intense. <coughs> her trial. وَإِنْ كَانَ فِي دِينِهِ رِقَّةً رِقَّةٌ أُبْتُلِي عَلَى قَدْرِ دِينِهِ And if there's some laxity, or if, not laxity, that has a negative connotation. If the riqa is, with, you could say, with some things um, thin, or, or if, imagine a scarf, that if you hold up to the light or something, you can see through it. Right? It's not very thick. Right? Uh, so if his, if his deen, his relationship with Allah is not strong, then he's tried ac according to his relationship with Allah. Allah won't send him something he can't. <coughs> That's far beyond his capacity. Can you be pushed? Can you be tested with more than what you can bear? You can. You absolutely can. So sometimes... People, so this is why I don't take deen from, uh, you know, um, Instagram posts, right? <laughs> unless it's mine. Because <laughs> um, what happens is someone says, oh, Allah will test you more than what you can, you can bear. And then you see people, there, there are people who are in these situations, but they just can't handle what they're in. So how do you explain that? So literally, Maryam, radiallahu anha, she was pushed to the point, being one of the awliya, she was pushed to the, the point here as well in the hadith. She was pushed to, to the point of wishing for death during the birth of Sayyidina Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam. So you can. And that verse at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah refers to laws. Can or does Allah test you, try you, obligate you to do more than what you can bear? Does Allah say to you, believers, you have to fast 500 days in every single year? No, because it's not possible, right? And does He test you to do more than what you're actually capable of? No. Right? That's why the Sharia has this inbuilt system of ease uh, in situations. So then he says, the Prophet said, فَمَا يَبْرَحُ الْبَلَاءُ بِالْعَبْدِ So trials can stick to a person حَتَّى يَتْرُكُهُ يَمْشِي عَلَى الْأَرْضِ وَمَا عَلَيْهِ خَطِيئًا they, they stick to a person for such a long time that he can he'll walk on the earth without a single sin against him. It's all wiped away. All wiped away. Due to the problem, the, the suffering, the pain, all of that is wiped away. 
So you don't lose out. <coughs> so, <coughs> how hard can you be pushed? There's a ayah of the Quran in Surah Yusuf, which is also an interesting surah in this regard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, talks about the prophets who are given this task. Go and tell the people about God. And most people don't want to change. They're just happy with their lifestyle, especially if there's money or the social status involved like with Quraysh. So he says, Hatta idha stay asar rusul. This, their trial continues. They keep telling, look, when, say, the Khadija passed away and Abu Talib passed away in the 10th year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ continued and continued teaching and calling people to Islam whilst getting rejected and uh, harmed constantly. Uh, three years until uh, he moved to Medina. And the hard part in that, one of the hardest things of trials <clears throat> is the uncertainty. Right? Like right now you're thinking, when are they going to stop talking and type? Right? So that hard part in the trial is, as human beings, you don't know when the end is going to be. Let alone what the end is going to be. That is very difficult on a person psychologically. So he said, Hatta idha stay as of rusulu. And the trials continued until the messengers, who are the strongest of people, Hatta idha stay as of rusulu. They completely gave up. Inwardly, inwardly. Yas is when you lose hope. Istay asa in Arabic is when someone loses hope and then does it even more, like keeps going and any thought that will come, no, there's hope yet. No, there isn't. No, there isn't. وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا or كُذِبُوا There's two qiraat. This verse is revealed to be recited in two ways. <coughs> and they become certain <clears throat> in their own mind, they become convinced of, there's, the, there's two ways of, uh, of, of reading it. One, kuzibu, that everyone's going to deny them. The disbelievers are going to deny them and never ever believe in them. That's one qira'ah. The second qira'ah is when they've lost hope, وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا They're convinced that their thoughts, their hopes, you know, that, that hope in a person's heart, it will happen, it will happen, don't worry. They, they even convince themselves, no, that's, a, that's wrong as well. Right? So then, and at that point, what happens? Ja'ahum. And the word ja'ah also indicates something. What's coming is tremendous. Ja'ahum nasruna. Our help, our tremendous, magnificent help came to them. So, people can be pushed like this. Uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says to the Sahaba, <coughs> Did you convince yourselves you're going to enter paradise? And the similar scenario of those who have just passed. Has it even come to you yet? Just passed, meaning if something uh, has, has happened recently, it's more likely to happen again. As opposed to something happening a long time ago, anything could have happened to stop it, right? But if it's recent, it's more likely to happen again. What happened to them? Masathumul ba'sa. They were just touched. So there's two ways of understanding this. A touch is a very tactile sense. If you run your finger over your palm, you can feel the ridges and the grooves. You can feel all of these things uh, in a very dis uh, distinct way. Also, it means it's light. It's not a hard blow. Meaning, no matter how hard things could have been, it could always be worse. There's a blessing in that. So anyway, <coughs> harm. So here you could say financial harm. And physical harm, which includes emotional harm. All of that, those harms touched them. zulzilu, And they were shaken. The same word for an earthquake. They were shaken completely. I said about fitna at the beginning. They're shaken up right to the core, to the point that even the messenger, who's the strongest of people, and those who are with him, who are going to be next in line in strength of faith, where they even have to say, when is the punish? when is the help of Allah coming? So this is a very real thing. So where are we going? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> may test you like this. And in that situation, what do you do? What, 
you do simply you submit. What do I mean? Allah wants to make you a pizza, so don't try to be a pie. Yeah? So simple as that. Why are those things happening? Because there's an end in sight. There's an end in sight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to change you and train you, prepare you for something for your role in life, in his creation. Right? Uh, I noticed this personally, right? Um, knocked left and right from pillar to post for ages. And it altered my perspective on things. And, you know, and you could, you know, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <laughs> almost like that. <laughs> <coughs> my understanding of fiqh, my understanding of many things uh, has changed, right? And I believe I'm better suited to my role for this. So what's this? That the mana, the things that you, I wanted ease, and the things that didn't come, when that mana, um, uh, when I realized what the purpose of it was, the thing that I didn't get turned, actually, turned into a gift, right? Same scenario. So, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes people through these things. And just look, who are you dealing with? Who are you dealing with? You have a Lord who provides us with rain. And this rain is not acidic. This rain gives us the water that we need. You've seen the years when they start panicking or there's not, not be enough rain. In the Middle East they do this quite a lot, every year or so. Right? <coughs> they need to drink. <clears throat> in Jordan, uh, when, 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 uh, when, the, when the British divided Jordan, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, what they did is, there's a place near the Syrian border, so there's three borders there. There's Jordan, Syria, and Israel. And there's a, a lake called the Sea of uh, Tibris, I think in English, Tabari in Arabic. So it's, if, you, if you imagine, it's, it's here where Jordan is, right? And if you look at the line on the map, it goes all the way down. This side is Israel. It goes all the way down. And then it moves to uh, encompass the lake. And then it carries on. So the lake's on the Israeli side. Tilka qismatun diva, right? It's not a fair distribution. But they get it, right? So Jordan's very dependent on uh, rain for, to drink. <coughs> yeah, Allah provides us this. When you were born, you were helpless. You didn't even know where you are. You didn't even know what you were. You didn't know you needed food. You just felt some sort of pangs in that area down there. You needed to be cleaned. You need to, needed to be cared for. Who, who gave you parents? And those parents, regardless of how parenting can end up, that, though, that parenting at that moment, Allah has created ladies with the equivalent of uh, heroin. Right? They're all smack. <laughs> so I get to a certain degree that when a woman, when a, a mother who's uh, giving birth, when she cares <coughs> for her child, she gets the 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 body's equivalent of heroin, uh, heroin uh, released into her brain. She feels happy. She feels, you know, this is right and natural and good, right? Just looking after her child, right? You've all, however old you are, you've all survived to this day, haven't you? You've had food. In front of you, you've had clothing, you've been... I guarantee every single one of you will have had situations where you think, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever, uh, what am I going to do? And then Allah just gets you out of it, right? Every single one of you. And, you know, uh, so Sidi ibn Ahmad ibn Ata'illah says, لِيُخَفِّفْ أَلَمَ الْبَلَاءِ عَنْكَ let your knowledge of the one who's testing you, being Allah, let that knowledge lessen the pain of your trial. It won't take it away. If Allah's you know, testing you with something, some people have, you know, some people want children, they don't get children. And so whatever that test is that you're getting. Just this knowledge 
of Allah is the one who's testing me, let that lessen your pain. Why? فَالَّذِي وَاجَهَتْكَ مِنْهُ الْأَقْدَارِ هُوَ الَّذِي عَوَّدَكَ حُسْنَ الْإِخْتِيَارِ Because the one from whom the blows of fate, the problems have come and hit you, the one who sent them, he is the, so he is the same being who's been looking after you in this tremendous, amazing way. All your life, not just you, every human being. Right? <coughs> so, in reality, <coughs> if you look at... <coughs> If you look at someone who's skilled, if you look at an artist, right, a skilled artist, even if he sits down to do a little drawing, he's going to do a good job of it. If, it's, if he paints a sign somewhere, it's going to look nice. So Allah is like that. Inna Allah jameel. Allah is beautiful. Everything he does is characterized with that beauty and wisdom. We just don't see it. He says, uh, so Ibn al also said, <coughs> The only reason why the things you, don't, you want in life and don't get, the only reason why that hurts you is because you don't understand what Allah is trying to do. Right? So how many, of us, uh, how many of you as a kid, you wanted a particular thing, but you know, your parents said no. Right? You know, some kids, I want to play with that shiny metal thing. And they know it's a knife. What's going to happen? He's going to poke his eye out or something, right? Or poke someone else's eye out. So uh, that's how it works. So it's, it's literally this, right? So, you know, my eyesight, you know, uh, the things that are far away are slightly blurry now. But when I wear them, oh, great, I can see quite clearly. If something's close, no problem. That's the same sim uh, scenario with our existence. The things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends, because they're far away, or they may not even exist yet, and you don't see the benefits of all the things Allah has sent you in life, it seems blurry. Like, what's the, like there's nothing there, there's nothing even worth uh, hoping for there, because it's blurry, you can't see. But when you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supremely wise, whatever He does is characterized with wisdom. That's when you get this, this understanding. It lessens the pain. It lessens the pain. Is that clear? Understanding this. And I guarantee you, most people who are atheists, right, there was a, there's something I read a couple of years ago. One of these Ivy League universities in America did, did a big survey. And, <coughs> and they found that most atheists are angry at Allah. It's a concept called misotheism, right? They have anger and hatred towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, if he doesn't exist, why are you angry towards him? Which one of you is really bothered and upset by the Loch Ness Monster? Right? Who wants to just go and strangle it? No one. So there's a, there's a proof in his existence, right? That their fitrah, their heart and their soul, the fitrah, the default human uh, setting that Allah has created us with recognizes there's a Lord but when they see problems and when they see human beings mistreating other human beings or they, they suffer this because they can't square it they can't understand it they don't, uh, they don't see well you know the, the Christian conundrum God is all good and all powerful so why is there evil they don't have this understanding of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we do we say look you might think something's evil but in reality, if you were to see the, the big picture, you wouldn't say it's evil. Like if I described to you a little kid lying, uh, lying on a bed and a guy coming up to him with a sharp knife and he cuts his chest open, you'd think, oh, what a horrible person. Why is he doing that to that kid? And then I give you some more details. It's an operation theater. The kid needs this operation to survive. He won't stop praising the doctor, right? It's exactly like that. When you see the big picture, when you see what Allah is doing, it makes perfect sense. So these atheists, they're angry at him because they've had problems in their life and they couldn't square it. They couldn't understand it because they don't have a framework. And they can act all rational. They can act like they're you know, so intelligent. But it doesn't work because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us 
in this way. To a life that is devoid of God is a life that is really, you know, devoid of light. <coughs> really. What's her name? Sylvia Plath, is that her name? Uh, this author, uh, I think she was a, a, an agnostic, saying that there's no way we can know that God exists. And you just read, just read, read her books, and the vibe that you get from the books is a bleak one, right? Like there's no hope. But the other thing we can do after seeing the wisdom is think about home. Where's your home? It's not here. Your home is paradise. And this is something I guarantee you it gives a lot of hope to people when they're suffering and they're struggling. <coughs> know that Allah has created you for paradise. Know that Allah has created you for endless joy, endless happiness, no pain, no suffering, no fatigue. Qutufuha <laughs> daniya. The fruits in paradise are close. You don't even have to stretch. The fruits are just there. Right? It's really close. There's nothing that would upset you. <coughs> and when the greatest calamities hit, what do you tell yourself? Allah will give me something better than this. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa akhlifni khayran minha. The Prophet said, whoever says this, oh Allah, reward me for my calamity, for this trial I'm going through, and give me something better. Allah will give them something better. So Um Salama radiallahu anha, who had <coughs> in her mind Abu Salama, the greatest husband ever, she used to say, who's better than Abu Salama? No one can be better than him. And then when Abu Salama was martyred at uh, Uhud, she, when she heard of his death, she said this, because she heard the Prophet say it. <coughs> and then she was saying to herself, how can I have something better than Abu Salama? And she married the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was by degrees, many degrees, far better than Abu Salama, radiallahu anhuma, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, you expect a reward. There's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when one of my believing servants loses, when I take someone who's beloved to his death, thumma ahtasaba, and he expects a reward. He says, the only reward I have in that situation for this person is paradise. That's all that there is. Yeah? It's paradise. So, expect a reward. See that Allah is going somewhere with this. It's not just a random thing. I've been after this for ages. I've been asking this for ages and it hasn't come. He's not miserly. He's not tight. He's, in fact, he's more generous than you can imagine. And, and the last point is stop trying to control things. You're a feather in the wind with regard to the things in your life. And the people who have the most pain are the people who have the most resistance in them. Right? If you went and just stood in front of that wall, you stand there for an hour, yeah, you'll get tired. But if you were stood against the wall and pushing against the wall as well, either gently or with a bit more effort or with all of your strength, you're going to get tired much quicker. How, quick, how, how quickly? Depending on how much effort you're putting in. That wall's not going anywhere yet, right? But <laughs> soon, inshallah, right? <clears throat> but <coughs> the harder you push, what are you going to do? Just tire yourself out. I really want this and I really want that to happen. And I don't want this to happen. It's happening. So instead of trying to stop the unstoppable, focus on this. Why am I pushing back? If it's not going to come, if it's not going to happen, what do I get from pushing back? Yes, there's pain if I don't get it. Okay, but you've lived with pain. Why not make that pain something that brings you happiness later? And just pain that brings you more pain now and more pain later. Right? Don't resist. Right? Asa and tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. Allah says, it may be that you hate something and it's incredibly harmful to you. وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And it may be that you dislike something, a situation in life, and it's better for it. Or, in another ayah, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا 
and maybe you dislike something, and yet Allah will place a vast amount of good in it, right? <coughs> so this is what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, to always give us tawfiq. What does tawfiq mean? It means to be aligned with the will of God. And everything goes easy that way, right? Um, when it's smooth sailing, right? Everything goes easy. But if you're trying to, you're trying to walk against the flow of the river, you're just going to tire yourself out and just be in pain, right? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and ease in everything that he decrees and does for us. Amin ya rabbal alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Any questions? Yeah. Um, first question was, how do you know whether a test is a punishment or a blessing from Allah? How do you know whether a test... <coughs> <coughs> is a punishment or a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, firstly, have a good opinion of Allah. Right? So if a test is coming to you, the fact that you're worried about this is usually a good sign that it's not a punishment. Secondly, Allah's mercy surrounds every single thing in existence. So even if there's an aspect of a punishment to a test, it can also be uh, a test to raise you. Right? A punishment in the dunya means you don't get punished for that in the akhirah. So that is a reward. But generally, like Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, <coughs> he said in one of his works that if you're angry and you're bitter about it and you're accusing God and you're shouting, Why are you doing this to me? that could mean it's a punishment. Right? But in reality, just understand everything is. Everything contains the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you might be punished for something now, well, that might be good for you. Right? Uh, it is important in life to, when big problems hit, to stop and take a look at your life. That's the reason why the tests come, right? According to the Quran and, you know, other sources. That's the, the problem comes to make you stop and assess what's going on. Why am I doing this? Why has this happened? Yeah? Um, how can we stop being bitter towards blood, blood relations when they inflict mental harm to you? How can we stop uh, being bitter towards uh, relatives when they inflict, inflict, let's say, physical and mental harm to you? So this is one of the situations where I talked about in the beginning. You have a practical way out, right? No one expects you to be a punching bag for someone else, right? So. Uh, even with relatives, there's ways of dealing with them. So at the very least, what you can do is minimize contact. And sometimes it's a case of you have to end contact with someone. I had a case of uh, a lady from uh, America, and her father had been harming her in the most despicable way for years. And she was going to move out and go to um, university. And she was worried about how can I... Uh, you know, uh, won't I get punished for uh, distancing myself from my father? I'm like, no, it's obligatory for you to do that. You have to get out of that situation. No one expects you to put yourself in a state of harm. I told them, go tell the police as well, right? Because you have to, uh, you have to stop harm. Preventing harm takes precedence in the Sharia over gaining a, a benefit. So if they're harming you, so if you have a specific scenario, you can message me and. Uh, I can advise you on that. But generally, um, you don't have to make yourself a doma. But at the same, the same time, you don't reciprocate with a form of harm to them. Okay? okay. Um, when you pray istikhara, why does the wrong person reappear if it's just another test? When you pray istikhara, why does the wrong person reappear? <laughs> yeah? Someone's not in the hint there, fam. <laughs> That's the hint. <laughs> the thing is, <clears throat> you know, most people have this thing, I'll pray in the Sakhara, um, I'll have a dream, right? Or I'll see green or something. It just, that's not how it works, right? That Allahumma ini astakhiruka, I'm asking you to choose for me. Wa astaqdiruka, and I'm asking you to make it happen for me. So what the, what's the istikhara? Is you're asking Allah to choose something. What did I say about tawfiq just now? To be aligned. One of the awliya said, alamatu tawfiq at taysir the sign that there's tawfiq, something aligned with the will of Allah, is that it's easy. Allah facilitates it. Right? 
I've seen, I had a friend who was trying to marry someone for well over 12 years, 10 years, right? It didn't happen. And then all of a sudden, uh, some lady came along and before you knew it, they're married. Okay. They see it. So if you're praying in istikhara about someone and another person keeps turning up, that might be a sign about this person, right? That the, the wrong person may be the right person, <coughs> right? You know, what's that? The wrong trousers, Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> they might just be the right trousers. So uh, think about that. If you're trying and trying and trying and trying and it's not happening, that's Allah telling you. What do you want? A letter from the sky. It's saying it's not going to happen. That's, that's a case of you pushing against the wall. Right? Okay. That's it. Any more? Okay, yeah. Are we going to call the adhan now? Yeah. Okay, right. We'll stop here. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallama. Wa baraka ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma laka alhamdu hatta tarda wa laka alhamdu wa da radita wa laka alhamdu ba'da rida. Oh Allah, we ask you out of your generosity to make us people that are always on your side. Even if it means being against our own side. Ya Arhamar Rahimin, we ask you to make us people <coughs> that understand the wisdom uh, of the things that you place in our lives, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you to make us people that are always aligned with your will, with cheerful, with a cheerful heart and a body that's willing to do what you desire, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. We ask you for the very best of this life and the very best of the next life for us and our loved ones, Ya Rabbil Alameen. <coughs> Allah, anyone here that has any difficulties in their lives, Grant them ease and relief from those difficulties and end those difficulties in the in the best way for them, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. Anyone that has any pain or suffering, make it easy for them and show them the wisdom in that, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. All that anyone here that has any debts, pay off their debts. And anyone, anyone that has any desires that are good for them and pleasing to you, facilitate those desires for them in the best and easiest of ways. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen With the intention of acceptance and bringing happiness to the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al-Fatiha